Hello, everyone, and welcome to your Glass Node on Chain 101, where this week we're focusing on a very important topic, which is an introduction to Bitcoin's supply dynamics. Now, this concept of supply dynamics is actually one of these big picture concepts that underpins a great deal of on chain analytics. What we're trying to do is assess the macro flow of funds, holding times across the network, whereabouts the supply is held, and really diving into all levels of granularity on what is going on with supply and demand. Now, as I mentioned, on-chain analysis really helps us observe the holding patterns, the spending patterns, the flows of funds. We can watch coins as they move throughout the network and see as they move between different entities. They come into the miners through issuance, they then transfer to exchanges, and they move around the system between investors, different entities, financial institutions, and the like. So what we're really going to do in this session is start very, very simple. This is very much an introductory course, and we're going to be looking at the circulating supply, issuance, and inflation, starting very, very simple. Where do these coins come from and what does it mean? We're then going to start to assess things like economic metrics, inflation rates, stock to flow. We'll look at holding patterns, what's going on in terms of uh, investors who've held their coins for one year and those who've held them for less than one year, what the cyclicality of that means. And then we're going to introduce at the very end a net position change metric. This is a concept that you'll see in a number of Glassnode tools. And there is a sister video to this, which looks at how we actually build this in Workbench. So I will point you to that later on, and you'll find it in the description below. But for now, let's get started. So as I mentioned in the introduction, we're going to start with a fairly simple concept and really give you a bit of, a, a bit of an insight into what supply dynamics is all about. Now, one of the really important components that we have to build in and we can use within the supply dynamics is the concept of time. Now, every coin in the system is contained within a UTXO or an unspent transaction output. Think about it like a container. The nearest equivalent is like a $50 bill. That $50 bill contains $50 worth of value. So a UTXO contains a certain amount of BTC value and we can actually tell which block it was last moved in. So we can see the transaction output, we can see where that coin was last mined on the blockchain. And if we then look at the timestamp between when it was mined into a block and the current period, we can assess the holding time. So what we can see here is the circulating supply in orange. This is obviously the total supply cap, and you can see these halving events where it kinks, and then we start to trend up towards that 21 million hard cap, which will happen somewhere in the era of year uh, 2140, so uh, some time left to go. Now, bringing that concept of time into the mix, this red curve here maps out the proportion of that supply in BTC that is older than one year. So coins that have not moved for over one year. Now there's going to be Satoshi's coins down here in this early phase. We can also see that as we start to move to the 2013, 14, 15 cycle, this is where Bitcoin markets were starting to develop very, very early. But we can see that we started to move into this more cyclical behavior. We got these peaks in these older coins. And then as we move into the 2016, 17 bull, we have a major decline. We see that we get this spending behavior the population of coins that are older than one year starts to decline, and these are when people are actually spending them and taking profits in the bull. As we move into the 2018 bear market, you can see that this actually starts to reverse again. We get this uptrend in these older coins. Now, what's going on here is we're seeing a transition of wealth. People are actually buying and sticking those coins away in colder storage for the long term. We're seeing a growing amount of coins coming out of circulation, going into wallets where they're remaining in a dormant state. Now, where are these coins coming from? Well, if we look at circulating supply and we subtract the coins that are older than one year in red, then we're left with the opposite, which is the coins that are younger than one year. And we see this in blue. And you can see how these two essentially oscillate inverse to each other by design. So when we're getting these periods, take the 2015 late stage bear market. Note how late in the bear, we see this massive explosion of these coins on older than one year. These are people who've bought all the way down, kept them in their wallet, and those coins are now starting to mature. And note here how the coins younger than one year start to really decline. And they eventually, this is essentially where those coins are coming from. Long-term investors, people with a very long time horizon who believe in what Bitcoin really is, they are accumulating coins, taking them off the market. And that means that there are less coins that are mobile and active and actively traded. And this eventually creates somewhat of a supply squeeze. We combine this with the halving event that happens in the circulating supply. So miners stop, stop issuing as much coins into the market. 
and we start to get this cyclical behavior where young coins explode during the bull. This is the maximum number of brand new people. They've heard about Bitcoin from their friend. They heard about it on the TV. They come in and historically speaking, they tend to buy near the top of these markets. So we get a massive swelling up of these younger coins, a minimum in terms of older coins. This shows that the smarter money who bought in the bear have essentially exited the system and the cycle tends to repeat. So you can see that with a very, very simple metric of supply last active one year, we can actually start to build dynamic supply and demand models and look at the cyclicality of coins moving throughout the system. Now, as I noted, supply last active is really one of these important metrics. And not only can we look at it at the one year old basis, but we can also, we'll look at this at the end of the video, expand this to many other age brackets. So we can actually see how this behaves across multiple age categories. Now, what we can see here, this is the supply last active one year metric. And this actually plots it out in terms of percent. So we can see the percent of the supply that is older than a certain age. And we can see here that during the early years of 20, 2011 and 2012, we oscillated around 30%, 29%. And you can see that over time, we've seen this gradual increase in the overall supply last active. At the top of the 2016 market, we had some 60% of the circulating supply that was held in these one-year-old wallets. And you can see that more or less as the bull market started, prices started to appreciate. And particularly when we broke past the previous all-time high, you can see that the spending behavior, this is the opposite. This is not accumulation. This is distribution. Those people who bought all the way through this bear and built up this supply actually start spending into the bull. And you can see that the intensity of the bull run actually was uh, met equal and opposite by the intensity of the amount of spending. These older hands are essentially liquidating their coins and taking profits. Now, eventually, the amount of coins being sold creates an oversupply and the market tends to saturate. There's simply not enough buyers and we revert back into a bearish market. Now note that some distance after the all time high, once the bear market has set in, things have started to equalize, the dust has settled a little bit. And also those buyers who still have that long term time horizon see that there are now coins that are trading at a much cheaper discount to the all time high. And it's at this point in time that they start to accumulate before we can actually see them in this metric. Remember, spending is instantaneous. You will get a decline in this the second that a coin is mined into a block that has gone from one year or two year or five years to zero. So spending is instantaneous. We can see this during bull markets and particularly powerful for looking at when markets are starting to get a bit overvalued. You can see all of this spending happening in near real time. As we move into more bearish markets, we actually have to wait for that one year period of time before we start to see this metric react because a coin that was purchased a year ago won't reach that maturity for 12 months. So you can see that this starts to climb following at some point in the middle of the bear when that yearly mark has passed. You can see it continues to accelerate. Now, later in this course, we're going to look at things like the hodl ways where we map it out beyond just the one year. And we can actually see coins moving from one day to one week to one month to three months, and then eventually getting to that one year. So we can see a more granular view of how coins are moving through that system. But you can see how the cyclicality of this, uh, this particular asset, you can see the supply moving through the system. You can see periods of maximum hodl where the most number of people hold their coins nice and tight, put them away into cold storage. And you can see that spending behavior that typically happens during bull markets and how that cycles through time. Now, obviously, these coins have to come from somewhere. We can look at what's called issuance. This is essentially the amount of coins that are being mined into the supply to the miners. Now, this is obviously a daily, a fairly noisy metric. We're going to cover in the next tutorial the mining fundamentals. It explains a bit more as to why this is actually a noisy metric. We see that it actually oscillates quite a bit day to day because we don't have a uniform amount of hash power on the network. We also don't have a uniform number of blocks being mined. But you can clearly see these halving events where we get this reduction of 50% of the issuance. So every four years or 210,000 blocks, we get a halving event with Bitcoin. So what happens is it goes from 50, 50 BTC per block and approximately 144 uh, blocks per day. 50 BTC per block, it then drops down to 25. And then we get another four year period until it drops down to uh, 12 and a half. And we're currently in a regime where we're sitting at 6.25 BTC per block. 
Now, interestingly, with every halving event, there's another, it mines 50%. So every four years, it mines 50% of the remaining coins that were left. So not only is it reducing the issuance per block by 50%, but it also over that four year period will absorb some, will mint some 50% of the remaining coins. So if there's 2 million coins left over the next four year period, it will mint 1 million of them. This is this interesting characteristic that the halving event actually has installed. But you can see here that we've applied this 14 day simple moving average really just to smooth it out. So you can really see where the supply is at any particular point in time and understand how much of those coins are actually coming into the supply. And in, in later sessions, we can actually look at how much the miners are then releasing to the market, how much they're hodling, so we can then build even more detailed bottles of supply and demand. Now, over time, as that halving event occurs, what we call the inflation rate or the amount of supply that's coming into circulation relative to the existing circulating supply will decrease. So you can see that our inflation rate in orange here continues to decline over time. So much the same with the halvings, we get more or less a halving of the inflation rate each cycle. Now note also that there is a gradual decline. That's because over the course of that four year period before the next halving, this circulating supply is increasing. We have approximately the same number of coins coming into circulation, but they're, they're diluting a much, much larger and increasingly large pool of circulating supply. So over time, we still get these downwards gradients as the inflation rate continues to drop and Bitcoin is programmatically designed so we can actually estimate what the inflation rate will be at any point into the future. And as I said, it will take about another 118 years by the year 2140 to mine those final coins and eventually the inflation rate will essentially trend towards a, a, a level of zero. Now, if we take the inverse of the inflation rate, we get a model called the stock to flow metric. Now, what this is essentially showing us is the stock is the amount of circulating supply divided by the flow, which is the annualized amount of coins coming into circulation. Now, there's actually an easier way to conceptualize this. You can see how it moves opposite to inflation rate. What this is actually modeling, let's say here we've got a value of 20. This means that it would take 20 years of Bitcoin issuing at its current rate at this point here, it will take 20 years to recreate the circulating supply. Now, as we know, every four years, we get a halving of that event. So this is why Bitcoin essentially that scarcity layer comes in because yes, we may require 20 years at this particular issuance rate, but we know that in four years time, it's gonna be half that. And you can see how the stock to flow ratio continues to climb. Now for reference, the gold stock to flow ratio is somewhere around the era of 60 to 80, depending on how you measure it, whether you include jewelry and various other investment bars and gold. But what we're looking at here is a Bitcoin stock to flow ratio of somewhere between 55 and 60 on any particular day. Now that means that after the next halving, that stock to flow ratio is more or less going to double up to the 100 to 120 range within daily fluctuations. And that will in fact put Bitcoin as a more scarce asset by this metric in relative to gold. And this will be the first time that gold has actually experienced a flipping, so to speak, um, within this particular metric. But that's the way to think about this. Stock to flow is describing how many years will it take at the current issuance rate to recreate the circulating supply. Now, the last section that I want to look at is kind of bringing a lot of these concepts together. And I will direct you to a video that we've created that actually explores how to build this particular metric. This is one that we built in Workbench, and we do have a guide that shows you how to actually model this and build this up. But what we've essentially mapped out here is what we call a net position change metric. And you'll see this show up in a number of Glassnode tools because it really shows us that 30 day change of any particular metric. It's a common tool we can use to really assess the flow of funds. So as we mentioned, those longer term investors are going to be accumulating Bitcoin during bear markets. This is one of these patterns that we see, and they generally start to liquidate during bull markets. So what this blue curve here is showing, positive numbers are essentially showing when those long term investors are adding coins to their balance over the last 30 days. Now, and the negative values that we can see here are when they're actually distributing those, when they're getting that spending behavior going on. And you can see, let's take the 2017 market, for example, as we rally into the all time high, note how we get very, very large negative numbers. Now remember, negative numbers mean spending and spending is instantaneous. We see this immediately. There's no time lag between the spending 
and a coin going from, from one year or two years to zero days. On the hodling side of the equation, it's a more delayed reaction. So we tend to have to look for sustained periods where we're getting this increasing supply moving into these one year cohorts. So what we're trying to track here is when we're getting these impulses of buyers, these impulses of sellers to really help us gauge where we are in that market cycle. And you can see through our 2021 period, we had a significant amount of spending into the January peak. We then had a softening through that market high. And really, since we got to around November, the all time high, this is where we really started to see this peaking higher. Now remember, that's one year delayed. So these buyers here, these, these coins that were accumulated during this period are actually from that 2020 initial rally. So we're seeing a huge number of those coins remain within that hodled state from that first impulse of the 2021 bull cycle. Now moving into some Glassnode advanced metrics tools that we have access to that really provide that even deeper level of granularity for how we can assess supply dynamics. We have over here our wrapped Bitcoin chart. Now we can consider things like ETFs or exchange traded products, the grayscale premium. We can see when we get these pools of capital where Bitcoin is actually held within some other asset. In this instance, we're looking at the wrapped Bitcoin contract on the Ethereum blockchain. So we can see how much BTC is actually being deployed into various DeFi protocols. So we can look at this on an entity basis, whether it's grayscale, whether it's an ETF. We can also look at it in terms of smart contracts of where those funds are uh, funds are flowing on different blockchains. Over here, we have our 90 coin days destroyed. What this is looking at is a sum of the amount of coin day destructions. This is introducing that concept of lifespan. We mentioned when old coins are spent, we generally get these peaks in these older coin spending profiles. This is showing that their coins are coming back to life. And we can typically see that these happen around market peaks when we actually get this explosion of old coins being spent, which creates that oversupply. So we can start to track out this cyclical behavior looking at coin day destruction. We can look at our net realized profit and loss. This introduces not only the time stamping, but also the price stamping of these coins. We can see when they're spent, are they realizing a profit here in green or are they realizing losses in red? And what we typically see here is that these will occur during bull market peaks. You get this large amount of profits being taken. During bear market lows, you see large periods of losses. These are capitulation events and they typically stand out from the rest. We then have our accumulation trend score. This is a metric that essentially looks at over the last 30 days. Is a large portion of the market adding to their balance? We typically see this at bull market peaks on the way up, but also during capitulation events on the way down, March 2020, and during our current bear market sell-off. We can see that we get these large periods of buy side. This shows that there's bull market strength, but also shows when the tides may be turning towards the lows. And we can also see these yellow colors. These are periods of distribution when overall on-chain entities appear to be relinquishing coins from their balance and we get a genuine slowdown in the amount of accumulation that's going on. So it really does trend between this zero and one to show us when we have aggregate distribution or aggregate accumulation. And lastly, as I mentioned, and one of my personal favorite metrics is the holloways. And this is where we can map out different parts of the coin supply at different age brackets to see how it moves through the, the supply process. We can see when coins are purchased and there's an impulse of these younger coins. We can see as they mature up through the different age brackets. And generally speaking, the older that a coin is, the more likely it is to stay put. And this really helps us understand more granularly what's going on at the supply dynamics level. So thanks for tuning in for this session. I do hope that you learned something new. I do recommend checking out our Workbench tutorial, which shows us how we actually built that net position change metric. You will find that that's a very powerful tool. And once you understand how to build something like that in Workbench, the amount of options that are opened up to you expands even further. There are many more things that you can do with this tool set to really take your analysis to the next level. So I look forward to seeing you in the next session and I'll see you then. Cheers.